Hello. Welcome to the Judge Ben Show. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont Superior Court judge. This is a program in which I interview people about issues of concern in Vermont. I've done several recently about the uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. And today is uh, another interview in this series. And my guest today is Chris Lukens, who's the director of an organization called Voices Against Violence, which helps people in Franklin and Grand Isle counties. I wanted to say before I start talking to Chris that during the show, uh, we've arranged to have 800 numbers projected on the screen for both domestic violence and sexual assault. And if you're in uh, a county outside of Chittenden, uh, you can contact the uh, organization that serves victims and provides information about these these crimes just by dialing that 800 number and you automatically be co corrected, connected to the program in your county that serves people who have these problems. Um, I'm very grateful to Town Meeting TV for providing this service and I hope that we'll, uh, we'll do some good through getting people more information. Chris, uh, are you the director of Voices Against Violence? Yes, I am. Oh, yep. good. And just, and what, in broad terms, what is Voices Against Violence? Sure. Um, we're an organization, and we're actually uh, a program of uh, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, uh -huh. uh, otherwise known as CVOEO. Uh, so they're our fiscal uh, provider. And, um, but Voices serves Franklin and Grand Isle County, and um, we provide services to families impacted by domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking, um, and uh, to adults and children as well. Uh, we provide a whole array of services um, under that umbrella. Um, and um, we've been around since 1980 in various forms, um, but uh, we, uh, we have a shelter facility, we have, um, we provide children's services. We provide help with legal services. Although I gotta say we're not attorneys, um, but we do you know, provide assistance in that area. Um, we do have a transitional housing program as part of our uh, housing um, services. And um, we have, we do education and prevention work. And we also have a pro program called All About Kids, which is, a program that provides supervised visitation um, for families, again, that are impacted by domestic and sexual violence. You're doing a lot. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, um, has, the, uh, has the COVID business and the lockdowns and all that stuff had an effect on your business? Oh, it absolutely has. You know, it, it's really changed how we provide our services. When, we've, uh, when this first happened last spring, um, and we realized that we had to kind of lock down and um, uh, staff went remote. And that's something we had never experienced before. Uh, so we had to quickly decide, you know, figure out how we were gonna do that. We had to buy equipment to do that. Um, we uh, had our hotline on uh, going through an answering service 24 seven. So we wouldn't miss any calls, uh, but we had to really look at how we were providing services um, you know, how people can access us when they were in their homes and they weren't able to leave. Uh, was it safe to make a phone call? Was it safe to use their computer? Those kinds of things. So we tried to expand um, access to our program. We, uh, besides the hotline, we started a chat line. So people can go on our website and actually just um, have conversations very, um, um, safe conversations, encrypted conversations with us. And uh, once we're done, those conversations go away. So there's no way to be able to go back, um, you know, for anyone to see any information. So that's one thing we're looking at, perhaps starting a, a text line. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we're looking to access, you know, be, be more accessible um, to people that are either you know, in their homes, um, they can't reach out, they're in very rural areas and they can't come in because we're not seeing people face to face right now, um, except um, we were seeing them in court, um, but even the court has gone um, totally um, virtual at this point. That's, that's really, well, that's a whole other issue, but that's mm -hmm. a real concern. 
It, yes. Um, how many people do you have working in Voices Against Violence? Currently, we have 11 staff. Um, Good. And we have, which doesn't include, we have an MSW, MS, excuse me, MSW intern from uh, UVM with us this year as well. So, The Master of Social Work? Pardon me? MSW, Master yeah. of Social Work? Of Master of Social Work, yes. I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. And so you you help people with housing if they're not safe where they're living is that the idea yes yes we can do that we as i mentioned we have it we have a shelter uh, facility it's called Lori's house and um right now we we have uh only three bedrooms available and because of covid we you know we have to socially distance we can only put one family mm -hmm. in each room mm -hmm. so our census is down in shelter certainly um but we also have um a contract with the state to provide housing overflow housing in hotels local hotels oh. so we have um agreements with with a couple hotels in in the area that we can um, put people up in hotels for shorter periods of time and then hopefully we can move them into shelter um and then go from there um so, so housing woman, is a big service that we do provide yes and, and 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 this is provided not just to a woman who's been a victim but to her children as well absolutely absolutely yes because I think in the past, in my dealings with some of these things, the concerns about housing have really prevented people from making a complaint because they don't have anywhere to go. Right. So if they've got some place to go, it's more likely they can reach out to you. Yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's that's the problem, you know, that happened in COVID. People weren't even able to get out and make that phone call to say that we need to, to get out. So we're seeing, you know, um, for a while there, those numbers went down a little bit. Those calls went down, but now we're at, we're seeing them go back up again. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the housing stock in our area, well, I think in, in the whole state of Vermont for that matter, but in our area particularly, we don't have a lot of housing stocks. So, um, and um, the cost of housing is, has you know, gone up um, you know, continually. So um, people are, are stuck, you know, even if they do leave and they don't have, you know, if they don't have a job, they don't have any way income coming in, it's very difficult for them to be able to support long-term housing. Uh, we do have a transitional housing program, which is very helpful. We have um, five apartments that we oh. provide um, to survivors um, so they can stay in those apartments for up to two years. And during that time, um, we work with them on building, building um, ways in which they can support housing moving forward, whether that's you know, through employment, or we help them get um, you know, assistance through um, housing vouchers um, and, uh, and help them create credit and landlord references and things like that that will help them in you know, securing um, safe and affordable housing in the future. I uh, was told recently that half of the homicides committed in Vermont during uh, 2020 mm -hmm. took place in domestic violence situations. So that's I think true. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Chris, I did, I did want to, Chris, I did want to ask you about um, um, court orders and things like this that you might be able to, what, what kind of court orders can you get to help people in this situation? Uh, well, we work with people who, one of the services we provide is to help people if they're interested in getting a relief from abuse order or straining order, protection order, they're called many different things. Um, so we can help them with that. Again, that process has changed because of COVID. So we used to be able to meet people in person, help them with the paperwork, because it can be a, a bit confusing um, and help them kind of form their thoughts so they can write down what is actually happening to them and why they need protection. Um, so that, you know, it's, it's easy for the judge to look at and, you know, determine. Uh, but again, that's being done remotely. So um, at this point, folks wanting, to apply for a relief from abuse order um, call. They, during the day, during the week, they can go to the courthouse and in, in the, right in the vestibule there, they can pick up the paperwork um, and take it with them and then they can fill it out. And then when that's done, they take it back and, and leave and it at the courthouse. Do you, do you, are you able to provide help to them in doing that? Uh, over the phone, yes, because again, we're not seeing people in person, so we can we can help them over the phone and ans you, answer. You can't you can't walk to the courthouse with them. Um, we no, we we generally don't do that. But um, if 
rare occasions when something happens that somebody needs needs to see us in person. I mean, we're starting to, to do that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, then we, we'll try to make that happen. But after hours is difficult because they have to call um, the after hours um, line um, and they're talking to a court clerk and the court clerk is helping them uh, fill out the form. And we're not part of that process because it's all done by phone. So but you, you can talk to them before they make the call. So they we know. Can. Yes, yes. So if that they, they call know us, we can, go through the, we can go through the form or even, uh, you know, afterwards, if they have questions, you know, we certainly can call and the court clerk does make those referrals to us for sure. But well, it just, you know, adds a little layer of you know, difficulty. Well, I think it's very important that people know that they can have assistance going through all the steps they might have to Absolutely. take. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a really daunting process, you know, for people that that want to do that. You know, it's I think the, the civil legal process is pretty daunting and it's difficult for people to grasp that. So, it, you know, it is um, we're there to you know answer any questions they may have. We also have a, a a legal aid attorney working with us. So she can actually help people and represent them in court during those oh, hearings. If, oh, that, that's very important. Yeah, if the other party is represented or if the case is particularly difficult, she can be there to help. So she's there every Monday in Franklin County when the, when the uh, relief from abuse hearings are. And we provide um, a legal clinic every uh, month. So people can call and get, you know, sign up for an hour or half hour of her time and can ask any questions that they may have. It could, it could be around protection orders or it could be around custody, divorce, you know, assets, things like that. So um, we try to provide as much information to folks as possible. It's a big thing. Yeah, it is. It is huge. And sometimes we do it twice a month because we have such a need for it. And now we're looking at maybe doing it once a week to help people so that we can touch base with people before they go um, for their final um, RFA hearings. RFA meaning relief from abuse? Relief from abuse orders, yes. Well, uh, do, you find, do you find that these orders are effective? Um, they can be, absolutely. I think, you know, and, and each person knows if it's, if it's the right thing for them to do. Um, we just, you know, we answer questions. Um, oftentimes survivors ask us, well, you know, is this going to work? And we, you know, we say, we don't know, you know, the person better than we do. And, you know, you, you um, may be able to um, determine if it's something that is going to work for you. I think for, for a lot of people, they do work. Um, it's, again, it's a piece of paper, but for some, uh, that piece of paper is enough to keep them um, from continuing to do You're harm. You're talking about a piece of paper that orders them to stay out of the house? Yes, yes, yes. And stay away from It can order them to stay out of the house. It can order them to not abuse, not be in contact, no third-party contact, those kinds of things. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's very important. It is. Well, when I, I've dealt with these cases in the past, I was always concerned about the children. Because mm -hmm. I think that the children who live in an atmosphere where there's domestic violence it's, it's just destructive and it right. stays with them for years. And these orders allow them to include their children. It's part of that protection. Well, that, that's, you know, well. It's important. Do you have, do you have contacts with the, um, with the police? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, we have a good relationship with, with all the police departments in our two county area. Uh, we actually have a, um, a project with the St. Albans Police Department right now called the LAP, which is the Lethality Assessment Program. And it's a, it's a program developed by a, a coalition in, a, in another state. And it is supported by the, the federal government through funding. And um, so we work with them uh, to provide training. And then when police officers, officers go to the scene of a domestic assault, um, they can determine uh, what the risk level is for that particular situation. So they have uh, basically a checklist and they have questions that they ask and then they check them off. And if there's um, the score is a certain uh, amount that may trigger a call to us. So they call our hotline and then the survivor on the scene can talk with um, one of our advocates and work out a plan or just provide support or, or say, we'll follow up the next day, whatever they need. If they need shelter, then we would you know, bring them into sh you know, shelter or 
hotel room. So, so. It's, it's not a situation in which the police officer can leave and then the woman gets beaten again. I mean, that, that's... Well, we hope not. <laughs> um, obviously, if, um, you know, if the person leaves, you know, the person perpetrating the violence leaves or is arrested or, or whatever. Um, and if not, um, then, you know, we may help her find some someplace safe to go. I think safety is so important. I think Absolutely. we're worried about safety is the big, uh, the big issue. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously most of the victims here are women and they, they're, they're worried that they'll be beaten as a consequence of complaining. Right, right. So if there's some way to guarantee safety, I think that's a key issue. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's the basic, you know, one of the basic services we provide is safety, support, and, you know, um, connecting to resources. So those are really some key um, goals of our program. Well, that's very important. I think this is important throughout the state. Other organizations that provide these services, I think, face the same thing day in, day out. Do you know are, about I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. There are um, you know, 15 programs throughout the state that are part of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. So every county or every region um, has a program that they can um, connect with. We're, we're, we offer the same basic services. Uh, some things are different, um, but some programs don't have shelters. Some some do, and uh, but we're all you know basically providing the same services. Well, I think that housing is a very key service. You know, yes, yes it is. That's something that. Well, you know, if if there's someone who's a, who's a victim of domestic violence, if they call the 800 number on the screen, they can find out what's available in the county where they live. Right. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. I, I tried it just as an experiment. I, I dialed <laughs> the 800 number and bingo, I was connected to your, <laughs> to your program. Oh, okay, good. Good, it works. <laughs> I can assure you that it works. It's yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so you actually do provide a service where you can actually go with a victim when they have to go to court. Yes. Um, not currently because there are no well, person that, hearings, but yeah. yes. Yep. Do you anticipate that the court visits will will begin again? I I hope so. I think you know they went strictly virtual after the holidays. I think in to try to avoid any spikes um, happening. So I'm hopeful that it will open up. It's just uh, it it makes it so much easier when we can be there face to face and providing that support um, for folks. Well. Thank you for what you're doing. I think it's so important. It's just so important. I think the consequences, you know, to the to the victims and especially to the children, can be so far-reaching. It can be something that will yeah. follow the kids for years. I know yeah, we we just have a we just received. Um, we're working on a project um, uh, that is actually really promoting some services for for children. And working with our local mental health program and, and therapists in the in the um, region uh, to provide some short term intervention for, for kids and moms that are experiencing um, domestic and sexual violence. So uh, we're excited to be part of that project as well moving forward. Wow. So you you work with the police. You work with other programs. You you absolutely. You you can really reach out and depending upon the case, it depends on what services are needed. Right. right. And you've yeah. got a lot available to draw from. Yeah. We can't do this work alone. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and we don't want to. So we do work with our community partners on, you know, to provide, you know, holistic services for sure. Gosh, 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 gosh. How many um, of these complaints do you think you get in the course of a year? Well, we, um, you know, our numbers are a little wonky this year because of COVID, um, of course, yeah. certainly, but um, generally, you know, we see probably between 500 and 550 unduplicated people a year that we provide services to. Uh, and that includes, um, that, that actually does not include children, that's adult survivors, um, you know, at a, um, about 100 to 150 um, children of those folks that we work with. But if you add the children that are impacted by the violence and the abuse, then we're talking, you know, a, a much bigger number. But um, so that that's probably, you know, what we do. We do about a hundred, you know, I'm trying to think about um, 1,500, 1,600 uh, hotline calls a year. 
that we receive. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I think every year it's, it's growing. We see more and more. Do alcohol and drugs have anything to do with the growth of these things? Or? We definitely, um, we definitely see that. We see the intersection of, you know, domestic and sexual violence, mental health and substance use for sure. It is um, oftentimes, you know, you know, survivors may use substances to numb the pain that they're experiencing, but they also can be drawn into that by the person that's, you know, causing them harm. It may be something that, you know, what that, a, um, a, you know, a perpetrator may use as a form of control. Um, if they, you know, use alcohol or use drugs um, to get that person um, to use that, so then they, they have that, that control over that person by providing the drugs or, Oh, oh this, so we see it in a lot of different different ways, and which is why we really work um, very closely with our um, substance use programs and, and, and our mental health because it really, it's just you know it, it it's the intersection of all of those and and the trauma and the more trauma people experience, the more that that can happen for them. So you can reach out to organizations and enlist their help with a survivor that you're absolutely you're absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you you know, we follow we follow a harm reduction model, and we work. You know, we work with people. It, you know, it doesn't mean they have to be sober to to get our services. Not at all. Um, they could, you know, continue to be using. It may be a safety mechanism for them at that point. So, we really work with people where they're at when they come to us for services. And it's and this this these these conversations and these things you're doing are confidential. I take it. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have very strict confidentiality statutes um, at the state level, but also at the federal level. Um, the Violence Against Women Act um, prohibits us from giving out any information without the express permission of the survivor. And our, our confidentiality forms, release forms are you know, um, noted for that. Um, so we can't you know, give out any information unless the, the person wants us to. Are there any resources you feel you should have in addition to what you're already doing now? Or is there more that people could, mm, could that's gain a good question. from dealing with you? <laughs> well, well, we, well I'm, I'm just worried about, uh, you know, about government services. I just think it's uh, it's a difficult thing. Yes, it is. I, you know, I as a director, I always worry about funding, um, yeah. whether we're going to have enough um, to, to do the work. I, you know, we could have more staff because the need is there. Um, and I'm particularly concerned next year um, after the, you know, the COVID um, funds, the CARES um, money came through uh, to help. Um, but what next year is going to look like, I don't know. Uh, revenues are going to be down in the state and that's going to impact our, our state funding. So I, I do think about that. Um, so obviously more resources in, in that area would be helpful. Um, but other than that, you know, you know, housing is a huge issue for um, survivors and, and their children. And, um, you know, we work with housing authorities. We, you know, there's a group of us that meet um, twice a week now um, since, uh, since the pandemic started just to talk about housing and, and um, go, going forward work, you know, with housing authorities and what it's gonna look like and how we can get more, um, uh, subsidized housing or, or even housing stock in our area. So that's that's a huge issue that it's going to be. Um, and if, if those activities led you to find work with hotels, I mean, you. You're, yes, you're... yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so because we just don't have it. But, but the good news is that um, we are going to be expanding our shelter. We're going to be adding two more bedrooms. Uh, one of the things that we did this year in the midst of COVID is to um, move some of the staff out of um, our, where the shelter was and uh, so that we could expand it and, and add some more bedrooms. So we're hoping, uh, I think within the next month to have those uh, bedrooms available. Um, it will help us again with social distancing. Um, we can't bring a lot of people in, uh, but we're trying to you know, at least have a couple more um, options for folks that maybe can't stay in a hotel um, or have animals because we're a pet friendly, friendly shelter mm -hmm. and they can't have pets in, in hotels. And we know that survivors, 
when they if and when they leave um, want to bring their pets with them because those pets are in danger as well and uh, we want to be able to help that so um, we do take pets in shelter as well well you're terrific thank you for what you're doing i think it really is important a number of people that i've seen in court who have had a difficult childhood it, it just it happens so often it's it's just very very sad well chris i want to thank you i think it's really it's vital what you're doing i hope that um i hope that people see this and those who need it can take advantage of your services well i thank you and i thank you for all your work that you've done well uh, to help victims over the years as well well we you know the, thank you thank you I, I don't compare myself to you, that's for sure. Thanks, mm -hmm. thanks again. Thank you. So long, so long. thanks for looking in. Um, we, you may be seeing some other programs on this subject soon, I hope. Bye.